Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the latest Service Department News webinar. Today, we are going to be taking a deep dive into the economy extended stay sector. My name is George Sell. I'm editor in chief at International Hospitality Media, and we are a publisher of B2B platforms for the hospitality and real estate sectors, and we're also uh, an awards and event organizers. Today's webinar is going to last an hour. Uh, if you have any questions for our panel, then please do um, submit them using the Q&A or the chat function in Zoom. Um, we'd like to get you all involved, all, all you people out there watching. Um, if you have registered but didn't make it along today, a recording will be coming to you via email shortly. So a couple of screen grabs here from stories that we've, we've run on Service Department News, just to give the conversation a bit of context. Um, some and some quite interesting ones here. We'll, we'll hear more about Wyndham's Echo Suites um, Economy Extended Stay brand, which has been a phenomenal success over in the US. Um, similarly, uh, Alex from Adagio is here. Their access brand is going great guns here in Europe. Um, the Rotana story up there at the top is an interesting one. Um, they have uh, announced plans to launch in London with their economy product, uh, product Centro, I think it's called. Um, and then there are a couple of stories there, uh, again, about the, the US sector, which is much more established than here in Europe. So let's meet our panelists before we get stuck in. Um, I'm gonna ask them all to introduce themselves and we'll go from left to right as we see them on the screen. So first of all, Ronald, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name's Ronald. I am in charge of development for UK Ireland, Nordics, uh, for Wyndham and Hotels and Resorts. And, and as you mentioned, Echo Suites is, is one of our brands, actually our latest brand, our 24th brand. Uh, Wyndham's a global franchise company. We franchise over 9,000 hotels all over the world uh, in about 95 different countries. Uh, I'm based in the UK and uh, our head office for this region is based in London. Excellent. Thanks, Ronald. Alex, good afternoon to you. Hi, George. Um, I'm Alex Van Pelt. I look after development for Adagio across UK, Ireland and Nordics. Um, and uh, Adagio is, well, we're the largest apart hotel operator in Europe. Um, and we have a really strong uh, two key brands we're growing in Europe, Adagio Access, the economy brand, um, and Adagio Original, the uh, mid-scale brand. So um, we, we're looking to grow via lease, uh, franchise and management. And um, yeah, very excited to be speaking about the economy segment uh, where we're very well placed in, in Europe at the moment. Thanks, Alex. And finally, Marvin, good afternoon to you. Hi, George. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm Marvin, Head of Development for Atalanta Hotels. So we are an uh, investment and management company focused on hospitality. Uh, we are based in Paris and have a portfolio of around 24 properties today, um, mostly in France and Belgium, where we have seven hotels and also some ongoing development in Italy and uh, focused on uh, Southern Europe soon. So we are... Um, working as operators and investors and partnering with most of the biggest hotel chains, uh, including uh, hotels and Adagio, so work closely with uh, Alex colleagues in the French and the Belgian market. Uh, we are, uh, yeah, I'm very happy to, to be here with, uh, with you, Ronald uh, and Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Marvin. Okay, so, um, oh, before we before we crack on, you can see the um, LinkedIn profiles for all our speakers in the chat there. So if you want to um, connect with them and carry on the conversation afterwards, then, then, then please do so. So let's get stuck into the conversation. Um, when I hear the words economy extended stay, the first thing I think about is the US market, which is much more uh, mature than we are here. There's a plethora of brands which, which specialize over there and aren't currently present in Europe. Um, Ronald, does that mean that the, the economy extended stay sector here in Europe is undersupplied? Um, and, and which do you see as the markets that, that have most potential at the moment? Where, where are you guys looking? Uh, look, from our point of view, it's always going to be called undersupplied, right? Because we would love to do more. <laughs> is it undersupplied? 
No, it's probably supplied in different ways at the moment. Maybe not by large branded organizations. Maybe people stay more in, in bed and breakfast. Maybe they stay more in Airbnbs. Uh, as where in the US, as, as you mentioned, it's, it's a lot more established. It's a lot more well known and it's a lot more brand driven. Do, do we see potential for this in, in Europe? Absolutely. I mean, Alex and Accor demonstrate quite clearly that you can do it, right? Uh, we just haven't done it yet. Uh, main markets, uh, I would say Germany, UK, Central Europe would probably be the initial focus. Um, once we, we've established some sort of templates in which the brand would work. Because at the moment, of course, it's, it's still very American. You, you'd have to adjust it to the European market. Um, I'd say roll out in, in UK and, and Germany first. Yeah, okay, interesting. Um, and Alex, you, you've obviously got the ball rolling. The, the Access product is, is appearing across Europe. Do, are you seeing increased demand for this kind of product? And, and which markets are... are um, do you, do you expect to be the most fruitful for you? Um, look, we, we've got over 50 properties um, across our network. So, you know, we're, we're a really strong player here. We don't really see much credible branded competition for us at all. 60% um, of our deals that we signed last year were actually in access. So, you know, that's kind of proof itself that, that there's a keen interest from investors and developers. And I suppose the beauty of, of, the uh, economy extended stay model. And from our perspective, you know, the unit sizes are smaller. You can go into some more peripheral locations. Um, you get quite a lot of keys within one, one building. You don't have to have such high ADRs. Um, build costs are lower. So, you know, from, from an investor developer standpoint, you can actually go into certain markets where, where there isn't, you know, that kind of presence. And, the deals can can really stack up quite well. So, yeah, we we're seeing definitely increased investor and developer interest in our in our product, um, yeah. and it's growing. Yeah. Okay, well, let's talk a bit more about the access product then and how it compares <laughs> with the other tiers of, of the Adagio mm -hmm. offer. So you meant you mentioned that unit size is is smaller. What are, what are the other what are the other differences? Yeah, so with Access, uh, we have two studio types. So we have a studio for two people, which is 20 square metres, and a studio for four people that's uh, 25 square metres. Um, the, the kitchen that is it's fully equipped kitchen, you know, obviously slightly smaller than the Adagio original. So we still have the uh, uh, two plaque hob, microwave grill, fridge, sink, fully equipped. And then we have in the, in the access, uh, both studio types, we have uh, a Murphy bed. So it, it flips up into a sofa and it becomes a bed. You can see on my screen behind me on the bottom corner, I've got the example of it as a sofa. So it um, it's gives guests flexibility. They can have bigger space in the apartment. And then um, we, we still have the same public area uh, concept, but it's smaller. So. If you look at a Dadji original um, for a hundred square, a hundred key property, we would need about three hundred and eighty square meters in the in the in the public front and back of house, and then for access, we would just need a hundred square meters less. So the public areas are are more compact. They um, are at an economy slash three star positioning, but they have the you know there's there's still the amenities that we offer. So. 24-7 reception, um, a breakfast co-working area. We have a fitness room, um, a little shop uh, for convenience goods, a uh, library of objects, and um, and the laundry room on site. So it's just much more compact. And, you know, that is really appealing to investors and developers because you can get a lot of keys in a building. And, um, and look, it's, it's appealing to guests as well. What what would be the the rough price differential between an access property and and the, and the next tier up? It's around uh, 50, ADR wise, we're around fifteen fifteen percent lower, fifteen to twenty percent lower. Yeah. Um, 
but they, in the interesting thing with access is in terms of the the segment that it appeals to it's um it's actually got quite a lot a lot of corporates that come there so our length of stays are longer versus a uh, dadgy original the, the mid-scale four-star brand and there's different factors which uh play into that but um one of the things is you can go into more peripheral locations, more regional locations. Adagio Original um, has uh, slightly shorter stays and they're located in more in city centres where you get the more leisure market. So that you'll get the higher rates, um, but obviously there's a bit more cost uh, for servicing the keys. But with Adagio Access, you know, it appeals to corporates for longer stays in these kind of more uh, uh, regional uh, peripheral locations. That's interesting. Because on first thought, I, I imagine mm -hmm. that would be the other way around. I, I, I thought the length of stay might be shorter because of the smaller units. But now you mentioned that. No, no, it, it, it's because of where they're located. Yeah. And, you know, um, we have at the, uh, in pre-pandemic, we were around 60 percent corporate uh, for Adagio access. We're down to around 55 percent now. Um, and Adagio, Adagio original is lower at around 40, 45% uh, leisure business. And how, bit, sorry, corporate business. <laughs> and, and, and how does Access perform overall in terms of occupancy and, and, and rev par compared with original? Well, you know, the occup well, they're not actually too dissimilar. The, the main thing is, obviously, you've got the rate discount, but because we have the longer stays coming through, um, we, you know... We have longer stays, slightly, obviously the lower rate. Adagio will have the higher higher rate, slightly lower occupancy. And we can, in terms of GOP conversion, actually there's not much difference between the two because like I was saying, you know, Adagio original, you get a higher rate because you've got the the, the four to nine nights, which is uh, stronger than, than with access. And that's where people are paying more, more to stay. But then, you know, in terms of the efficiencies, uh, access uh, has has the longer stay, so let fewer check ins and check outs, and um, housekeeping efficiencies, um, and you know VAT benefits in certain locations. So um, it's 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 it both offer a really compelling case. Yeah, yeah, no, it's interesting. Thanks, Alex. Marvin, you have got um, an access property in your portfolio in, in, in Brussels, I believe. What made you guys? opt for this particular brand uh, and, and what are your kind of plans in, in this space in the future? Yes, thank you, Dov. <clears throat> Actually, this case cannot really be used uh, as a way that we uh, decide, uh, had decision process. We were not in the decision process to, to, to choose the brand as it was already existing at Agile Access opened uh, one year before we, we took it over in our portfolio. Uh, we had that uh, project, uh, the first time we had uh, in mind the fact to position a uh, service apartment product was next to Basel in Switzerland, where we had a big combo of 120 rooms, and uh, we decided to go for a Mercure Hotel for 120 rooms, and the service apartment part of this big complex was branded at the Adagio. Uh, so I can only use to answer your question, most recent cases where we work along uh, the Adagio team to develop. And, uh, and and now it's really part of the reflection for us because Adagio access um, now is really aligning with the free star, I would say, economy hotel typical brands in terms of total GFA. So this brand helps us to you know, think about it before because of the size of the Adagio product, as Alex was saying, it's more, you know, aligned and uh, working in city center locations. So as we work mainly on, on development for projects today for Adagio access, it's sometimes, you know, suburban areas, locations, and uh, Adagio access is a good fit because of the size and the agility of the brand uh, to fit and to be aligned, I would say, in a cost and investment cost perspective to develop it. Uh, so, so we really have it in mind at the moment, working with uh, Alex colleagues in France and Belgium to develop products. We see a lot of potential, especially in secondary cities, where um, in France it's quite developed because of you know developers who were uh, who, are, who have their own brands. But today in secondary city, we we see a lot of potential in France and Benelux, as well in Southern Europe, Italy, Spain, Portugal. 
where where there is no really you know uh, a proper development of service departments and especially on the economy segment. Yeah. Okay. But your your initial property is in Brussels. Do, do yes, you, it's in that, Brussels. Does yeah. that perform differently from how you expect ones in in secondary locations to perform? No, it's really well performing, and this is the the fact that because in the city center you will find less uh, a percentage or offering of service apartment. The fact that you don't have, especially uh, uh, the primest location, it's a bit you know a second tier of of the of the top city, for example, Brussels. But the fact that we have a good connectivity to the city center and that we offer a solution for extended stay but get the clients to maybe choose for a larger access and come maybe a bit you know further from the city center but have a nice a nicer and a bigger room accommodation with all the services and then get the connectivity to go in the city center so we will we, we will the, the fact that this is it is this diversifying as an offer uh, from a client perspective that helps you basically to balance the fact that in the beginning maybe you don't have the best location and that's really the, the point and a, and, a, and a key advantage of developing uh, also with Adagio Access. Mm -hmm. And does your customer base at this property reflect what Alex was saying, sort of predominantly corporate? Yeah, long definitely. Yeah, definitely. Because uh, the, the location of the hotel is quite, it, it's really made for extended stay because it's in front of a hospital, one of the biggest hospitals in Brussels. So, you know, for pre and after you know intervention in the hospital for 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 the people who go to the hospital but that's a solution for them to stay a bit before and after the the, the intervention and then in the meantime for the family to come so there is the hospital there is one of the biggest university campus in in, in brussels so with a lot of professors that need to come for conferences need to come for you know one week two week courses so we can stay in the hotel and there is also a lot of you know business headquarters around the hotel. So we really have this plant mix with around 20 to 25 percent of very long stay, I would say, plus 20 nights. Uh, that makes a very good basis for the hotel. Uh, mostly business focus for people you know looking for transition in housing, coming to live in Brussels, but they just arrived, they need to find maybe later on a, a, a real long-term solution for housing um students but uh, maybe should come for six months just for to do a course in the Brussels university so that makes maybe 20 25 percent of the business and then we have business corporate also because belgium and brussels is a key hub you know for parliament uh european parliament so people coming every month you know two to three four nights so i will definitely say we have more um business clientele, maybe up to 60 65 percent and now, of course, with the seasonality, now we had, for example, a very good summer in Brussels. The 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 the, the, big, the corporate demand was not there, but the hotel was performing a lot because of what we can offer for, for example, families and and later clients. And also, the quality of the hotel is very nice. Uh, should definitely look for it on the on the, on the website to see a new design from other sources. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Marvin. Um. Ronald, Project Echo not only started a craze for new brand launches called Project Something or Other. You were, you, I think, you were the first first to do that. But it's been a phenomenal success. I think there's well over two hundred. Um, yeah, would you would you believe that, right? It's just unbelievable. We we launched this brand, and you know, internally you set yourself goals like how many hotels do you want at this brand. So we. They said, let's be ambitious. Let's aim for like 300 in 10 years. We got 200 signed up in a year. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's the fastest growing br hotel brand in the US full stop, not just in, in extended stay. It's, uh, it's been yeah, it's, it's the most successful brand launch ever. And, you know, it, it has even surprised us. Look, we know the product works and, and the reason it works and resonates with owners is it's been designed with owners basically we we invited some of our our key partners to sit down with us and say listen where are the gaps in the portfolio what sort of offering have we not got that do you see demand for in your existing Wyndham properties and and what changes 
should we make and should we launch a new brand? And, and some of these partners said, yeah, you should. Uh, so, so we worked together with them on, on the initial design. We worked together with them on the standards, uh, on how the whole franchising model for extended stay would work. And, and as a result of that, when the brand was ready for launch, most of the people that worked with us on the development of this brand obviously signed up for a number. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We, even we did not realize they were going to sign up for that many numbers. I mean, I, I saw like just after we announced that, that we reached 200, they signed up a deal for 16 units in Canada. Yeah, with with one developer. Obviously, this is going to grow out over a number of years, but there is from the investment community there is great appetite for the product. You know, like Alex said, it is quick to construct, cheaper to construct. It's highly efficient in in the use of space, particularly because this being the US, it's basically a cookie cutter model. Will provide you with the basic floor plans, we'll give you the layout. We know exactly how efficient it's going to be. We can tell you how much it costs to build this. We can tell you how much the FF&E costs. We can tell you where to order it at negotiated prices. I mean, they ran the numbers on these on these units and they're predominantly like, the standard unit is, is 124 keys, yeah? And the return on investment was 17.9%. It was on paper, yeah? Because the first one isn't open yet, but when they ran all the numbers, and um, actually over time, it has become more more advantageous to do it because costs have gone down. When we did the initial initial numbers, things like construction costs were still quite high. They have gone down. We're now doing bigger numbers. We're getting further discounts. It has become cheaper to develop these properties. Uh, so the return looks like it's only going to get better. Now, this is the US and cookie cutter works, right? And Alex is going to tell you in a minute that cookie yeah. cutter does not work in Europe, right? Because land is expensive. It is difficult but, but, to fit Ronald, the pro- I, product into the space. Can I can I just butt in there a sec? Yeah. Um, Echo is not the only cookie cutter new build extended stay hotel out there um why do you think it's taken off to such an extent when there are other companies doing what would appear to be a similar proposition what, what is it about I mean, not not just whatever? appear to be I, I have seen some of our major competitors launch extended stay brands and i've seen the visuals of what these look like honestly they look exactly the same yeah one of them even has a as a standard format which is guess what 124 units so yeah i'm pretty convinced everybody got that same message uh why is ours taking off so much i think the key element is that we work with our owners yeah we listen to them we got their buy-in before we launched the brand And we are very focused on making sure that for the owner community, this is a very good investment. And I've compared our numbers on construction, uh, FF&E and that sort of stuff to, let's just say, our major competitors that are bringing out similar products in the US. And look, in their view, they are being really cost effective, but they're nowhere near as cost effective as we are. Because remember, we are the biggest economy, budgets, whatever you want to name it, operator in the US. This is our market. These are our owners. These people understand this business and the system works. So they want to do more. Yeah. Okay. So the crunch question then, Ronald, is when you bring the brand over to Europe, which you talked about potentially doing so in the UK and Germany, how much of the original concept comes over and what will you need to change to make it work here? Let's just say it's a work in progress. But, you know, you, you've been to America. 
room sizes of, of, of the same sort of scale as America is not going to work, right? Construction costs over here are entirely different than they are in America. They're not going down, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, no, no. And they didn't even they didn't even start as low as they have over there because relatively it, it's cheap, right? Compared to compared to Europe. So yes, it will have to adapt. Now you're going to ask me how is it going to adapt and what are the changes? I haven't decided yet. But as with every US brand that moves to to somewhere in Europe, it'll shrink. Yeah, spaces will become smaller. The standard unit size of an Echo Suites in the US at the moment is around about 31 square meter. Uh, and, and you can compare that to, to Alex just mentioning 20 square meter. There's a big difference here. And that difference is due to the fact that space costs a lot more money here. Yeah. yeah? And, and if you want to build something with, with 30 square meters, you need an average rate for that 30 square meters. And that's not Echo Suites at the moment. Yeah. If you were to ask the man in the street in the UK, to name an economy a hotel brand, they'd probably talk about Travelodge or Premier Inn or, or, or somebody like that. Is that who you anticipate Echo Suites will be competing with when you do launch over here? Uh, to to an extent, yes. Look, you you will be competing to to certain segments that currently stay in these brands to come and stay with you, and the difference that you offer is is there's a bit more independence, yeah. I, I travel a lot. I'm basically away most every week. And sometimes it would just be nice if I can make myself a bit of toast or do something for myself in my room and not have to go down and find a restaurant or do some basics stuff in my room without someone constantly coming in wanting to either check my room, clean my room, check my mini bar. You know, if you're there for, for three, four, five days, and you know, sometimes I'm in the same location week after week, you're quite happy to look after yourself, yeah? And and you know where the local facilities are. So as, as long as you are in a location where you have good connections, like Marvin said, it's essential that you have good connect connectivity to where you need to go. Uh, I think... Extended stay product is is really appealing. You know, it gives you probably a bit more space than the previous brand you were staying at. Uh, and it gives you a fridge. Yeah. So you can buy a pint of milk and keep it there. Not have to rely on some sachet that you've nicked from the breakfast buffet. Yeah. Okay. Enough about your traveling habits, Ronald. <laughs> 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 no, we, we are Wyndham. We make travel possible for everyone. <laughs> Alex, you've you've uh, you've raised your hand there. Did you want to come in on, on something? Yeah, I, I just wanted to touch on, you know, the, the element of potential competition between Premier Inn and, and, and Travel Yeah, yeah. Who, yeah, who I mean, who do you consider as your competitive set for, for access, for example? <sighs> well, <laughs> we well, in a way, it's because we're quite a differentiated product, competition at that level on the extended stay site is actually quite limited for us. Yeah. But we we can compete with the likes of Travelodge Premier Inn, but um, those are more for the shorter stays, one to three nights. And, you know, we could capture some of the business for those kind of clients looking for a differentiated product, um, which is still obviously obviously growing in, in Europe. Um, but but not to the same degree as the, the the kind of regular extended stay market that we all we all know. So we see actually we can take some business away, but you know the people that want to stay in those kind of properties have a specific reason. But when you come to an apart hotel at an economy positioning, you you you're coming because you want those the, you know the kitchen, the facilities, the 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 lounge um, kitchen lounge area. Um, you want to have that freedom to be able to choose whether you want to eat in the property or or outside be able to bring food in and then kind of have like a home from home feel so that's that's what we we offer access you know at that economy positioning and um in terms of that we actually have a number of combo projects with accor um brands so we have ibis ibis budget ibis styles i'm actually 
the two images diagonally opposite each other. That's a combo for us in Ghent, and that's an IBIS budget uh, with an Adagio access, and they actually work really well together. So there's because they're they're targeting different markets, they uh, and they're a very differentiated product. They can sit side by side, and as long as the revenue management and the pricing is 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 well well managed and done correctly there's going to be very limited kind of cannibalization between the two two brands so we've got multiple combo projects all across all across europe and and the middle east with with the two brands side by side and they they do work really well so i think um it's yeah it just makes it and it also makes for the developer or investor it kind of diversifies the risk slightly you know they've got they don't have just one big tower of you know keys of, of a hotel or an apart hotel you've got a balance between two differentiated products that can give you um interesting um EBITDA conversions yeah yeah and and obviously you're in development so this might this might not be your area of expertise but do you know do you know about the distribution and how how people book access is that different from the other Adagio products and you know, and 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 for example, an, an Ibis hotel in a in a combo development. Well, so we we have the benefit of the big Accor distribution channels. So we've got one hundred and ten channels um, to distribute via. I think, in terms of the corporates, you know, they we have negotiated corporate accounts, and um, we we I would suggest we probably get more business direct. Yeah. Um. So less OTA fees um than than say you know with a more a kind of more the more leisure side so that obviously is beneficial because obviously although we get negotiate we can negotiate the ota rates down it's much better if it's you know through our own distribution channels yeah yeah and alex you you kind of went some of the way to answer my next question earlier when you said uh, i think you said 60 percent of the adagio pipeline is access yes so, uh, I, I wanted to talk about investor and developer sentiment to this segment it's it's clearly good are you seeing new investors and developers coming in as a result of having a lower price point product yeah i think look we're all i mean ronald i would love to have uh, a developer want to come and do 16 <laughs> adagio axes as in one go but me too <laughs> yeah um, oh, over here it's not quite as uh, as easy as that but um there is a lot of a lot of interest in our um in, in in the access brand particularly because there's no real competition for us um on a branded on, from a branded perspective and um and yeah the build costs are are low, much lower you know than than a than a than a full star uh mid scale extended stay product so there are lots of compelling reasons why developers and investors are interested there's already the, the appeal following the pandemic of the extended stay sector because of the resilience it's shown i think the fact that we've got you know a, a more corporates is also quite exciting because we don't know how long this re revenge travel is going to last um so the, the business model with access is is pretty resilient and um yeah we've seen we've seen new investors we we we're actually continuously kind of changing our, our brand um, and concept. So we've got a new design coming out um, in early next year, and it's a brand new access apartment, uh, brand new design. Um, and then we've created a co-living concept for access. So we already have one for Adagio Original, the mid-scale brand, but we've been developing um, the concept for Adagio Access. So it's it's got a... It's the rooms are smaller, 12 and a half square meters. We have the communal living space. And the idea is you have three, four, five, six bedrooms, bedroom apartments, and you can welcome groups of travelers who want to stay together. So leisure and the corporate side. So we know the demand exists on the leisure side with Airbnb. And in our portfolio, we've realized that actually the demand exists on the corporate side where we saw guests booking a number of rooms together um and uh sleeping in three um hanging out in the fourth and so we've created this uh concept at this economy positioning um 
and already incorporating it in a number of projects, one of which is uh, one which is opening in London in a couple of years time. So that'll have four, four bed co-living apartments. So I think the fact that um, at Adagio we can, you know, we can now target different groups of travellers, so solo travellers and people who want to travel together and diversify the, the business model and, that, and the risk associated, that is appealing to, to new investors and developers. Yeah. You haven't really seen that that in the market either. And Ronald mentioned that the Echo Suites came about as a result of, you know, input and demand from existing owners. How did access come about? Was that through consumer research, or was that coming from from owners as well? Yeah. So, well, we launched Access quite a long time ago, back in 2011, and um, Adagio already existed. So the Midscale brand. And then we acquired a portfolio, an ex Citair portfolio, because we saw there was demand at that economy positioning, but there was nobody in the market that really was meeting that demand. So we created access. And then um, since then, you know, we've we've we, we've also seen, you know, the proliferation of economy brands across across Europe. But there is no um, economy uh, brand at that positioning other really than Adagio Access so I think uh, for us yeah we've been we've been really well established in it for, for a very long time and um, seeing continued uh, interest from investors and developers yeah okay um, Marvin do you think that more hotel brands will be launching uh, an economy extended stay offer in the future and, and are you saying the increased interest in the segment from your investors? Yeah, we see strong appetite for um, service apartments uh, offer. Uh, I think I just can, can just you know confirm what just uh, what Alex just said about diversification of the risk because of the of the business model, right? We saw during the pandemic that uh, you know the decrease in respa during 2020 and 2021 was much lower in service apartment segment rather than than traditional hotels and uh, you know the covid is still here all in you know in our in our minds and uh, we think you know differently now in our business plans anticipating a lot of scenarios and uh, it's very comfortable to focus on a service apartment positioning because you know that in case you know we don't know what kind of what what of what kind will be the next crisis but we know it will come and uh, I think the service apartment positioning that gets you more comfortable in your investment. So especially for institutional investors, the fact that you have this diversification and this capacity to switch from one client mix to another, depending on the momentum, that's it's really comfortable. That's the first thing. Now, regarding the scope of brand, I think it's what really stood out from maybe the development of Adagio and other brands it's really to have the dedicated team, a dedicated brand, uh, because we see a lot of new new brand in the hotel chains and the consolidation of the brands. But uh, and the fact that, for example, there is no hotel suite, which becomes no hotel living, and now you can do also, you know, just a traditional brand. You had a living next to it, and that gets you the suites. You know, the kind of service apartment offering. Um, we think there will be aggregation, uh, I'm going to say, link from the service apartment is inspiring from hotels and hotels are inspiring from service apartments. Uh, but it really needs to be a brand with a focus, a dedicated strategy, uh, because what is really important is the, you know, the pricing strategy. We're talking about the combo. You can, of course, have a combo with Hybis, and we are working on one project like that in Belgium right now. Uh, yes, you can have two hotels, one AB style, one Adagio, but if you uh, keep the same, you know, strategy and pricing patterns, this is not going to work. So the service apartment for us uh, can work as a hotel. A hotel can not work as a service apartment. It's really about the pricing strategy. So brands, I think, will 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 come with a lot of digitally, you know, orchestrated brands like Sunder, Numa, that are coming, for example, in the market. Now they reached to enter the French market, for example, which is quite complex. So we see a lot of new entrants in the market with different kind of offerings, and uh, that will, you know, provide investors and developers a lot of new options. But I think uh, 
I'm introducing for a lot of investors right now. Yeah, thank you, Marvin. Um, Ronald, hotel companies, as we know, are, are um, they, they have kind of a conveyor belt of, of brand launches. I mean, between Wyndham and Accor, between the two of you, we're probably not far short mm -hmm. of what, 80, 90, 90 brands. W what do you expect to see happening in, in the next couple of years in this particular economy extended stay space? I mean, you're, you're obviously um, looking at the segment very closely, which presumably means that other people are too. So w what do you think is likely to happen in the sector? Uh, what do I think? Look, there are going to be more economy brands. Let's start with that. Economy hotel brands, yes. Growing market, there will be more. There will be more brands, be that individually launched or launched by one of the big operators. Extended stay, of course, got a head start in the economy section, extended stay, yeah. So everybody knows that it's successful. Will there therefore be more brand launches? Probably, but it doesn't necessarily need to be something that they launch themselves. Yeah, it, it could well be that, that one of the big hotel companies basically decides, okay, this market is now big enough. We're going to consolidate this and we'll buy two or three of these brands or companies. We'll combine them. Uh, have a base of maybe 50 to 100 properties and from there start to grow the band throughout Europe, both of which are, are likely to happen. Yeah, There are always new brand launches. There are always new concepts. And some will work out and, and some work really well in certain locations, but not elsewhere. Uh, but the ones that are scalable at some point will be consolidated. Yeah. Okay. Um, Alex, what, what's your take on potential new entrants into the market? Um, look, I think if you compare the economy segment, well, the extended stay segment in Europe versus Europe, US, it's already undersupplied anyway. The economy sector is even more so. And I think there's lots of compelling reasons for why people would want to, to invest in this kind of segment of the market. So I think we'll see that it's just how these brands, which are in the US to date, how they can, if they come over, um, the key sizes are pretty large and um, the associated costs to, to develop will be much higher. So um, I think there's a, there's a definite challenge there. I thought the um, the Rotana announcement was quite interesting. Did you see that one? The, the Centro brand. They're looking at a couple of sites in, I think New Malden is one. Kind of you know London yeah. suburbs. Do you know those sites in particular? And do do you know that brand? Well, they're the owners of I, I believe are, are the Ibis and the Adagio in Sutton. Okay. Yeah, at Sutton Point. So yeah, we were quite familiar. But um, they're uh, those. Yeah, those locations are um i suppose they are they're quite peripheral and yeah for more for an access kind of kind of product but um i'm i'm not necessarily too worried about <laughs> that, that that side of things for now to be honest okay and i was interested to hear that you're inter you're introducing the co-living units to access as well yeah will that be on a similar ratio to uh to uh, to an original do you think that you could potentially have scope for even more of those in, in, in an access building. Um, we're never going to develop more than say 15 to 20 percent of the entire part hotel as as a co-living. So and it's co-living from an apart hotel perspective. So it's still C1, but the idea is to welcome groups of travelers um wanting to stay together. So for us, they'll always sit alongside in the access model studios for two people and studios for four people. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're literally incorporating them into a lot of projects that we can. Um, and the owners and um, developers seem pretty interested in this and the, the, the kind of resili increased resilience it can provide to our to our business model. So, yeah, we are we are incorporating, but at a, you know, not too many because we're not it's not co-living. It's um, yeah. it's a part hotel our business is a part hotel business yeah 
but presumably in terms of revenue per square meter those units are even more productive than than the rest of the building aren't they well the thing is these um these apartments are let as a hot as one they're they're you know they can be quite big um what we're seeing versus a traditional um studio two packs and four packs mix in a building we um, and the revenue that that would generate so profit per square meter we're not expecting to have a higher profit per square meter with a co-living what what we would see is a slightly reduced occupancy but a much higher uh, average rate and we don't want to we don't want to let these properties for, for short term we want to have longer stays definitely a minimum of seven days because they do you know cost a bit to, to for the housekeeping so we can't have one or two nights so um we, we're not seeing it as any um any different in terms of profit per square meter versus our traditional product it's just a differentiated um product that we're offering to to guests yeah okay um ronald going back to the potential differences between echo suites in the us and, and europe when it arrives do you yeah. how do you anticipate the the um the customer base differing if at all between the us and europe yeah uh probably substantially i mean it's a, for starters, it's a, it's a different labor market in the US, right? People are generally a lot more mobile, uh, will move across the country to change jobs at a moment's notice. And when they arrive there, have to set up their new life. Yeah. So a large segment of your, of your guest is, is actually moving for their work or are on assignments for their work. And that could be for months on end. Uh, you see that in in Europe a lot less, uh, both the tendency to move country at the drop of a hat, which if you're in the UK becomes a lot more difficult too. And, you know, people don't work that way, but you do have uh, people that are on assignments for during the week. You know, they might be in one place during the week, go home for the weekend. Uh, there is a student market a visiting student market there is a hospital associated market i can see that clearly look i've done this sort of product in other parts of the world before the, the other big market that there was is uh, people recovering from plastic surgery so in places like turkey this works really well because you want a product where you can re recuperate before you go out into the world again unleashing your uh, new ashes on the world uh, exactly and even for shorter stays, there is demand because some people just want to look after themselves. Yeah. So I'm not anticipating the average stay to be three to six months. Yeah. We'd be quite happy with an average getting around about nine. That'd be really good because that means you'll have a good base of, of extended stay customers. And then you can yield your units on, on the ones that have the shorter stay. Uh, so on the whole, I think that the, the profile of the guest is going to be different than the US. And, and bearing that in mind, that's that's what you also use to, to adapt your product to a market, right? A, a total cookie cutter approach works in the US because it, it's, it's one market. Yeah, Europe is like 20 odd different markets and you will have to tweak it in all these markets to make it work for the local area. What does the US model have in terms of amenities and communal spaces and, and how, how will that be adapted to come over here? Uh, it has a communal laundry. It has a small gym area. Uh, it has uh, some communal space on the ground floor, but no F&B facilities to speak of uh, apart from some vending machines. So there's not even a man shop. It's, it's all machines. And do you imagine, do you anticipate that will be quite similar when you bring the brand over here? Uh, again, I look, and this decision hasn't been made yet. So I'm going to give you my opinion. And that's my personal opinion. Yeah. If there's a shop next door, I don't need a vending machine. Yeah. If there's a restaurant next door, I don't need to do anything about food. This depends on the location. Yeah. If we're putting an echo suites 
uh, in the middle of nowhere in Germany, and there is nowhere else to go for people to eat or, or do anything else, you'd either speak to the developer and say, listen, is your plot big enough to do a restaurant next door? It doesn't have to be with us. Or, or you look at incorporating some sort of food offering because, you know, otherwise you're not going to fill your hotel if people can't either get there or, or eat, drink, uh, and do what they need to do whilst you are there. I'm, I'm loving the, the co-working uh, the co-working areas that our friends at Accor have, and I'm, taking, I'm actively taking notes here. I'm stealing everything that will work. Um, I, I, it didn't escape my notice that um, your job title and Alex's are pretty much in parallel. You're competing with each other in exactly the same market. So uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll let you two carry, carry on. on. Oh, <laughs> oh thanks. <laughs> um, okay, I want to finish up by uh, asking you all to um, get your Mystic Meg heads on and um, have a look into the future. What do you think the European economy extended stay sector will look like five years from now? And I'm gonna pick on you first, Alex. Um, I think we'll probably, well, Adagio's access is gonna be even bigger, first of all. Um, we're gonna have more, we've already got, like I said, 60% of our signings last year were with Adagio access. So we're seeing that grow. Um, I think we'll probably will see some of that of those you know some new players coming over um and adapting products and some some acquisition of, of existing portfolios and adaptations and you know there's there's a lot of office stock out there so I suspect there might be some conversion plays on that um to 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 different economy se segment to extended stay. But yeah, it's a growing segment and it's a, a it's an exciting segment to to be in. Marvin, where do you think we'll be in five years' time? How do you how do you think the market will look? I think it will continue to grow as it has been uh, and again pushed by the, the pandemic period. I think it will come also a lot from conversion from existing buildings, but we all know office areas, office districts which are undergoing difficulties at the moment. That represent already existing, you know, square meters available. Sometimes well, you know, organized, and the layout could fit to to implement the external stay. And this is what we are working a lot on. I think everybody heard about it. All developers, all owners, uh, big uh, offices owners, they are thinking about switching the assets from a uh, office to uh, to to hotels or service apartment. I think service apartment for this kind of location is gonna be the, 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 the big winner uh, in conversion. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, a lot of hybridation and uh, and it's going to also inspire, get on the trend of the lifestyle, get on the trend of, you know, good design, because as we said it today, what changed is been diversification in terms of product, but also in terms of client mix. And we'll, of course, maintain a good offering for corporate demand, but also include more and more, you know, filling for leisure demands. Um, and I think yeah, it will get a lot of inspiration from what is done in lifestyle brand to, to perform and develop. As well as the office conversions, we've seen in, in the UK, at least, we've seen a couple of um, conversions of, of retail assets into apart hotels as well. Is that something that you're looking at? Is that is that a similar across Europe that, that retail premises are becoming available for, for reuse? Retail, I would say the layout is not always very appropriated for conversion because of the of the of the size of the of all the of the of the floors. I would say offices work much better, but uh, definitely a lot of discussion and reflection. And also discussing about conversion, I think uh, uh, a lot of hybrid projects and mixed projects where you're going to find uh, 200 residential units, uh, 100 apartments for co-living, a piece of hotels. And uh, also the operators and investors are going to maybe, you know, include more, you know, capacity to, you know, invest or operate a big assets uh, with different, finally, usage of, of, the, of the different units that you can find. Yeah, thanks, Marvin. 
Uh, Ronald, last last word to you. What, what's the economy extended stay sector going to look like in Europe five years from now? Alex and Martin have just told you. <laughs> uh, no, what, sure. what, I, I tend to agree. Look, it's going to be a market where Accor's market share are going to be substantially smaller, right, Alex? And I agree with Marvin that I think you'll see a lot more hybrid solutions and driven both by uh, investors' appetite for spreading their risks over, over different components in their development. So I can perfectly see co-working spaces being operated under one brand, uh, extended stay product under another brand, uh, maybe an office component, maybe a residential component, uh, which brings life to your development and, and spreads the risk for the developer. So I can see that working. Uh, and I, I think more smaller units overall. Look, traditionally, we'd love to do anything with 200 keys, yeah? I don't think you'll see many of those. There'll be smaller units, but more of them. And probably a bit more lifestyle orientated because everything's lifestyle these days, right, Marvin? Yes. All right. Well, Look that's... at that you access in Brussels. <laughs> okay. Um, that's a good note to end you on. Thanks. Thanks very much, Alex, Ronald, and Marvin, for, for your input today. Just going to show a couple of slides before we wrap up. Um, and we'll also leave the session open for a couple of minutes at the end so you can take some notes from uh, all the stuff that's in the chat. The next Service Department News webinar is on the 12th of October, and it's going to be hosted by my colleague Eloise. And it's a it's a meaty old subject, the future of business travel. Um, it's something that is being debated a lot and uh, quite a lot of contrasting opinions around. So that should be a good one. Uh, the link to register for that session is in the chat. If you're interested in working with us here at IHM, either on our digital platforms or as part of our um, in-person events, please do get in touch with one of my colleagues, Jordan or Piers, who you can see on the screen there. Uh, you can see their contact details there and also in the chat. And thanks for watching. Thanks again to Alex, to Ronald and to Marvin for their input today. It was a really interesting discussion. Um, if you are on any of the social channels, you can see on the graphic there, um, do uh, interact with us and, and get involved. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on another webinar soon. Thanks very much.